All right, so why did we spend so much time talking about long division and synthetic division of polynomials? Sure, it's helpful to know how to divide polynomials, but what's its real benefit and application? Well, I wanted to make sure that we had the tools we needed so that we knew what to do when we started dealing with the following really important theorems in, um, in math. And those are the remainder theorem and factor theorem. So let me take a moment and just break them down for a second. Here's what the remainder theorem says. The remainder theorem says if a polynomial function is divided by some factor x minus k, the remainder is the remainder, which we'll call r, is equal to f of k. Now let's think about this for a second. Let me just kind of break this down with numbers. Suppose you took some function and you divided by, let's let me just come up with some random function here. So just f of x here. And we're dividing it by some factor. Let's just say it's x minus, I don't know, 2 right here. Well, that means r0 is 2. So this is our k value here. So 2 is our k value, which we'll just, we know is our 0. What this means is that this function evaluated at 2 is going to be the same thing that your remainder is. So whatever remainder that you get out of doing this division, it turns out that is actually the value of the function evaluated at that root, which I think is very cool. Now, this leads into just as important of a theorem, the factor theorem, which then says, okay, now continuing on with that, if that remainder is actually zero, then that tells you that x minus k is actually a factor of this function. So if it turns out that this remainder is equal to zero, so this re remainder is now equal to zero, what, what does that tell us about this k value? That is a zero of this function. Therefore, this is a factor of this function, okay? So let's actually put it into uh, words here. And like, let's, let's try this with some actual problems. So let's think about the remainder theorem first. Previously, if I said evaluate this function at negative 5, what did we used to do? Let me just do this in red to show what we used to do. We would say, all right, f of negative 5 is equal to 4 times negative 5 cubed plus 10 times negative 5 squared. Anywhere there was an x, we're just replacing that x or substituting that x with a negative 5. And all of this, just to kind of spoil alert, comes out to negative 243. So we said f of negative 5 is equal to negative 243. All right, we could do that just by plugging and chugging. Now, let's actually try to use the remainder theorem. What is the remainder theorem saying? It says, if we take our function f of x and we divide it by, so f of x, if we go 4x cubed plus 10x squared minus 3x minus 8, and we divide it by x plus 5 here, whatever that remainder turns out to be, whatever our remainder is, is actually going to be equal to f evaluated at negative 5. So since our denominator is linear, we know that we can use synthetic division here. So I'm going to set that up. So I'm going to take my function. So 4, 10, negative 3, negative 8. Those are all the coefficients, if you will remember, and my constant. And I'm going to divide it by or I'm going to divide it by x plus 5, meaning I need to put negative 5 here on the outside. So doing the synthetic division, I'm bringing down that 4. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20, which I'm writing here. Negative 20 plus 10 is negative 10. Negative 10 times negative 5 is positive 50, which is then 47 when we add those. 47 times negative 5 is negative 235. And add that to negative 8. Well, that's negative 243. Well, check that value out. That is our remainder. And what does the remainder theorem tell us? It tells us that f evaluated at negative 5 is going to be the remainder that we get when we do our division. And what do you know? It matches up to be exactly the same thing in both. Okay? So we can actually now use synthetic division to evaluate functions, which I think is pretty cool. Now, on top of the remainder theorem just being useful for evaluating functions, it can then give us information about how to efficiently break down functions that might not easily be factorable using the factor theorem. 
Because remember, what does the factor theorem say? It says that if that remainder turned out to be zero, then guess what? X minus K is indeed a factor of the function. So let's try this now with the factor theorem. Let me kind of zoom in on this. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that X plus two and X minus four are indeed factors of this function. And then once we've broken this function down a bit, we, we, we will be able to do the complete linear factorization. I'll explain that a little bit more. So let's set up the synthetic division. Since both of my factors are linear, it's going to make our lives a lot easier just to set this up synthetically. Now, if my factor is x plus 2, I'm going to put negative 2 on the outside here. So let's go through this. So this is 8. Not sure exactly what happened here. This is 8. 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. Negative 16 plus negative 14 is negative 30. And then that would give us positive 60. Negative 11 once I add, and I'm just continuing along here. 22 minus 10 is 12. 12 times negative 2 is negative 24. I'm going to pause for a second. This remainder here is equal to 0. So I've just confirmed that x plus 2 is indeed a factor of this function, f of x. That is what the factor theorem tells us. Now, I need to show that x minus 4 is also a factor. Now, I don't have to start this process all over again. I can continue on now with what we have with this cubic function that's resulting here. So I'm going to draw another line here. And I'm going to continue this on now with positive 4 on the outside, because that's a 0 we would have with x minus 4. So now I'm going to show that x minus 4 is a factor of this function here. Because if it is indeed a factor of this function, it shouldn't matter that we already divided here by negative 2. It should still work. So we're going to continue on. We've got 8. This then gives us 32. 2, 8, negative 3, negative 12. And what do you know? We get 0 as our remainder again, which confirms for us that x minus 4 is indeed a factor of this function as well. Now, pause and think about for a second, what, we, what do we have left over here? What does this represent? This tells us that when we've taken f of x and we divided it by x plus 2 and divided it again by x minus 4, we're left with the following quadratic function, 8x squared plus 2x minus 3. Now, ask yourself, is this something that I can factor? And the answer is yes. This is the same thing as 2x, oops, 2x minus 1 times 4x plus 3. So what we've just now done is by doing the synthetic division and applying the factor theorem, we've been able to show that this function, f of x, this original function that we have here, can actually be factored as the following. x plus 2, x minus 4, and then also 2x minus 1, and 4x plus 3. This is what we call a complete linear factorization. We've completely factored this function so that each factor is linear. So each of these factors here are linear. This is what we call a complete linear factorization of f of x. Why is this useful? Because now I can use this to actually find zeros of functions and graph functions like this that we previously might not have been able to do by hand. Now, the final kind of theorem, and it's not really so much the theorem that I want to discuss, but actually the test that goes with it, is what we call the rational zero test. And it looks kind of complicated when I type it all out like that, but here's all it's saying, is that all the possible rational roots of a function will, can be written as the factors of your constant. So in this case here, your constant, a sub zero, we take all the factors of that constant, and we divide it by all the possible factors of your leading coefficient, which we call q. So you'll often hear me say p over q. Well, I'm referring to the factors of your constant divided by the factors of your leading coefficient. Those will give you all the possible rational zeros that you can use as, as a list of zeros to check off when you are trying to break down or do the linear factorization of a function. So let's look at a couple of these. So let's try coming up with all of the possible rational zeros of this function here. So we've got 2x to the fifth plus 4x squared plus 3. Well, 
what are all my possible, oops, don't want to write with a highlighter. What are all my possible factors of P? Well, I know my factors are one and three. Well, hold on for a second. I could also consider the negative factors. That is to say negative one times negative three would also give me positive three. So I can just kind of efficiently write this as positive negative one, positive negative three. Now, I'm going to divide this by all the possible factors of Q, which are all the factors of my leading coefficient 2. So same deal, positive negative 1, positive negative 2. Now, we don't want to leave our answers as such. We actually want to write out the list of our possible rational zeros. So we would say 1 divided by 1, or positive negative 1 divided by positive negative 1 is positive negative 1. Then what about positive negative 3 divided by positive negative 1, that would give me positive negative 3. But I could also now go to looking at, which is a different color, positive negative 1 divided by positive negative 2, in which case I would consider positive negative 1 half. And what about positive negative 3 over positive negative 2? Well, that would also be positive, well, not also, positive negative 3 halves. So ask yourself, how many possible rational zeros do I have? I've got eight of them. Eight possible rational zeros. Okay. So now that we have all that, let's put it all together and let's actually use the rational zero test, the synthetic division, and our understanding of the factor theorem and the remainder theorem to try something like number Four here. Let's give this one a go. Let's do the one here and let's try to factor this completely. So first off, let's find our possible rational zeros. So P over Q. We're going to say positive negative one. Remember, we're looking at the factors of negative four. Positive negative two, positive negative four. Now we're going to look at the possible factors of three or not the possible. These are the factors of three. So we have plus or minus one, plus or minus 3. So once we do all the possible divisions, we're going to have what we had, then also positive negative 1 third, 2 thirds, and 4 thirds. Okay? So in total, we should have 12 possible rational zeros for us to check. Now, this is the part that's a little annoying for some students because it is a little bit of a guess and check game. But we can also look at the numbers when setting up our synthetic division to kind of give us a sense of what we want to try first. Remember, in order for something to actually be a zero, we know that this number here has to be positive four because I want my remainder to be zero. So sometimes you can kind of start thinking about choosing numbers to help ensure that this final number is going to be four. So for the sake of time, know that I may not want to do too much guess and check, but let's just start with something like one. Why not start with positive one? Well, let's just run through this quickly. I'm going to bring down the three. So three times one is three. So then this is going to be three, seven, seven, negative four, negative four. And I don't think this is going to be it. This is negative 20. And yeah, this actually gives you negative 20 there. So positive one does not work. So instead, let's maybe try, again, I want my remainder to zero, so I'll just leave that there. Let's try negative one. So if I try negative one, this is three, negative three, one, negative one, negative 12. Uh-oh, here we go. There we go. There it is. So it turns out negative one is indeed a zero. So let's just keep track of this. One of our actual zeros is equal to negative one. So now we have a quartic. And here's the deal. I always recommend to students, pause and take a look at the resulting function that you have. This is 3x to the third plus x squared minus 12x minus 4. And ask yourself, can I actually factor this? And some of you are looking at that and nodding. And to you, I would say, then stop with the synthetic division. Just start factoring this. Don't do any more guess and checking if you already know that this is something that you can factor. But let's say you don't see it. Let's say you're looking at that right now, or maybe you forgot to even check, and you don't actually see how you could factor this. Well, it's all right. We can keep going with the synthetic division. So if I keep going now, 
I'm going to try to guess another possible rational zero. You could try the same one. In fact, we could have the same as zero appearing more than once. But let's try something like positive two, for example. Remember, if it is a zero, it should still work here. So we have three, six, seven, 14, two, and this is four. If I want to make sure I did this correctly. And here, that should give us zero. And I think that actually works. Let me just check to make sure I did that right. That looks good to me. So I've got now this right here. And so I can say that this is 3x squared plus 7x plus 2. Oh, and also we said x is equal to 2 is another 0. So does this actually work? And let's see if we can actually factor this. 3x plus something times x plus 2, 1. What do you know? We got this all factored down. What are the zeros that come from this? And let me actually just do this in a separate color. So from that, I should be able to write my zeros of negative one third and negative two. So those are my zeros. What are my, what's my complete linear factorization? Let me just write this underneath. We said that f of x now is equivalent to x plus one, because our first zero is negative one, x minus two, three x plus one, and x plus two were our other linear factors. And so these are all my factors and my complete linear factorization of my function. So we use the factor remainder theorem and our understanding of how do you apply the rational zero test to get here.